So here's my talk. So we'll talk about a little bit about the background about this diseases, this group of diseases. I've divided it up into gallbladder cancer, uh, resectable gallbladder cancer, where the role of the medical oncologist is about giving adjuvant therapy. Undersectable gallbladder, where we treat these patients uh, for disease control and uh, palliation of symptoms. And similarly, we'll talk about the same thing as far as cholangiocarcinomas is concerned and conclude. So geographically, gallbladder cancers are a very diverse disease. We have some of the highest incidences of gallbladder cancer in India. And similarly, we do see similar uh, high incidences in Chile, as well as in the Far East. Uh, these are some of the major epidemiologic studies that have been done for uh, gallbladder cancer in uh, India. And you can see that our incidences are all over the map. So the one year survival for this disease, if you take all comers, not just the early stage disease, is about 22% and five year survival is somewhere between five to 10% as was mentioned previously. And surgery is the only potentially curative therapy for gallbladder cancer and you can improve the survival, the five year survivals to 15% all comers. Now the problem is that only 10 to 20% of these cases can be resected with a curative intent. And even those that go through with the surgery, your likelihood of five-year survival is quite small. So there is definitely a role for adjuvant chemotherapy in gallbladder cancer. However, most of the studies that have been done uh, historically have been statistically underpowered. This is the NCCN guidelines. So now let's say if you've taken a patient for gallbladder surgery, you can have one of three outcomes. One is you will have an excellent R0 resection with negative nodes. Or you may have a good resection, but you may have positive margins or positive nodes. Or you may have gross residual disease. In the first two group of patients, you have good data or decent data from the BILCAP study. Now, the BILCAP study was done in this group of biliary tract cancers not only gallbladder cancers, but biliary tract cancers, where you've managed to get an R0 or R1 resection. And if you have a good, healthy uh, performance status patient, you can treat these patients either with, they were treated either with capecitabine at a good dose, 1,250 milligrams per meter squared twice a day for 14 days out of 21 days for eight cycles, or they were observed. And in that group of patients, as I said, you know, it included both gallbladder cancers as well as uh, cholangiocarcinomas. They were able to deliver a good amount of the drug. About 55% of the patients received all eight cycles. And what they found was that, now what I'm showing you here is the ASCO abstract. They were able to see initially that there was an improvement in overall survival as well as in relapse-free survival at a decent cost in terms of side effects. That means the quality of life was not reduced. And yes, you did have some side effects as I, as I noted over here. But overall, it was a group of uh, patients that tolerated the treatment reasonably well. The conclusion that was drawn was that it improved overall survival, at least initially, at modest toxicity and reasonable quality of life. And however, what happened was subsequently when they, the paper made it to print in the Lancet, it did not meet its primary endpoint of overall survival, but was able to show a trend towards that. However, given that this uh, study did show an improvement to a certain extent in overall survival. The NCCN has categorized it as a level one evidence. So this is certainly something that you can do. That is, you can give these patients oral capecitabine with some improvement in overall survival if you have either an R0 or R1 resection. Now, turning to the next group of patients, that is the third group where you have uh, gross residual disease or somebody who has 
unresectable disease. In that group of patients, what you will have is that there is uh, either local vascular or uh, you know uh, invasion of the regional lymph nodes. You may have a large mass invading the liver. And in this group of patients, it is unresectable. There is a significant drop in the five-year survivals from 20.9 months to 5.8 months, but as you keep progressing um, uh, along the TNM stage. Now, what happens in that group of patients, let's say if you have somebody who comes in with jaundice, is we talked about the people who are resectable. Now, in that group of patients, as uh, Prasad had mentioned earlier, you can still consider new adjuvant therapy, especially if you find that the surgery is a significant thing to do. If it's unresectable, it's rare that you will be able to move them to a resectable state with new adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the regimen and so on and so forth. But what you have to understand is that new adjuvant chemotherapy makes resectable disease more resectable. It also improves your ability to understand if this group of patients we are treating are likely to have a good outcome from a biologic perspective. That means, let's say if the disease is progressing while you're on chemotherapy, chances are even the best surgery is not going to save this patient. And once you treat them with new adjuvant cholecystectomy, you can then proceed with cholecystectomy if you have patients who have more advanced disease. If you have unresectable disease, there are two parts to it. One is, of course, chemotherapy. But nowadays, we have biologic agents, which we will talk about uh, subsequently. Let's say if you have unresectable gallbladder cancer, what can you do? Well, the most active chemotherapy agents are gemcitabine, cisplatin, 5-FU, oxaliplatin, and capecitabine. Now, when we treat these patients either with new adjuvant chemotherapy or you treat them as unresectable disease, we give a combination of these. And there are various studies that have used various combinations of these. If the disease has not spread beyond a particular point, that means it's mostly locally advanced, you can add radiation and you can add 5-FU and capecitabine to that radiation. However, the weakness of this thing is that while you can achieve local control, uh, there is a risk that you can cause uh, damage to the liver because the liver is fairly uh, easy to damage with radiation. So it has to be done carefully. You can add 5-FU or capecitabine to the regimen. Now, we can all be proud of this phase three study that came out of India, published in the JCO. And this is a study which used a combination of gemcitabine and oxaliplatin or 5-FU or what is called as best support of care, which is the third one. And what they did find was that people who were treated with this combination of gemcitabine and oxaliplatin did better than the latter two parts. There are other regimens. There is gemcitabine with cisplatin if you can give cisplatin to the patient. And that did improve the median survival by 3.8 months. You can get a pretty good response rate. That means you can get the disease to respond with either gemcitabine or 5-FU based chemotherapy, um, either combination or as a single agent. The problem with that is that most of these studies are non randomized and are small. We have other agents in our armamentarium now uh, besides chemotherapy. I will talk about these in greater detail as we move to the next part of the talk. But briefly, there are tumor agnostic. That means, let's say, if you do what's called as next generation sequencing, and you find that there is a mutation with something called as the NTRK uh, mutation, there are these drugs that are available. Uh, they are expensive, but some of them are available on clinical trials. Uh, everybody talks about immunotherapy. And let's say if you have either MSI high, which is not common, or you have a, somebody, a patient who has uh, PDL1 positivity, I'll talk about these two things. You can potentially use an immunotherapy drug called pembrolizumab. There are two other uh, 
targeted therapies. One is FGFR mutations, and there is something called as IDH1 mutations. Now, we should not forget the important role of palliation for gallbladder cancer. Uh, we've uh, had a lot of discussion earlier by both Dr. Fadke as well as several others about the importance of biliary drain prior to surgery. Now, sometimes what happens is that you may have to do it subsequently when the disease comes back or if you have disease that is advanced. And uh, that is something that we have to consider. About 30% to 50% of the patients with gallbladder cancer do develop gastroduodenal obstruction. So the question is, are you going to bypass these patients early or are you going to put a stent in? Uh, third possibility is sometimes doing a venting gastrostomy uh, to relieve the symptoms of the patient who may be fairly miserable because of the symptoms of this. And lastly, pain control, either using narcotics or uh, using various blocks to relieve the patient's pain. Uh, we move on to cholangiocarcinomas. And we've talked about the uh, classification of cholangiocarcinomas uh, in the previous talks. And it's basically a cancer of the epithelium, both intra or of the intra or extrahepatic ducts. Uh, as was mentioned previously, two thirds of these patients have perihilar tumors. A lot of them are unresectable. Sometimes what happens is that you may have to do it subsequently when the disease comes back or if you have disease that is advanced. And uh, that is something that we have to consider. About 30% to 50% of the patients with gallbladder cancer do develop gastroduodenal obstruction. So the question is, are you going to bypass these patients early or are you going to put a stent in? Uh, third possibility is sometimes doing a venting gastrostomy uh, to relieve the symptoms of the patient who may be fairly miserable because of the symptoms of this. And lastly, pain control, either using narcotics or uh, using various blocks to relieve the patient's pain. Uh, we move on to cholangiocarcinomas. And we've talked about the uh, classification of cholangiocarcinomas uh, in the previous talks. And it's basically a cancer of the epithelium, both intra or of the intra or extrahepatic ducts. Uh, as was mentioned previously, two thirds of these patients have perihilar tumors. A lot of them are unresectable. And here, the active agents are fairly similar. 5-FU, capecitabine, gemcitabine, cisplatin, and oxaliplatin. As you can see, most of the drugs seem to be fairly similar in both groups of patients. Now, chemotherapy works. 5-FU, which was the first drug that came, uh, does improve your survival versus best supportive care. That means no chemotherapy, just symptom control. And it's, it approximately triples your likelihood of survival. Gemcitabine, which is the second agent that came out, uh, did improve your overall survival um, and time to progression significantly versus 5-FU. And in that group of patients, we do have some improvements in survival when you continue to treat these patients. Now, in a pooled analysis about the role of chemotherapy in, these, in this group of patients, what was found was that gemcitabine with cisplatin showed a better response rate and tumor control. And that is generally the reason that we use this combination uh, for treating our patients with biliary tract cancers, especially cholangiocarcinomas. Now, this is the ABC2 trial that Prasad had mentioned. It uh, was a good study. Uh, it was pre presented back in 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And in this group, what was found was that uniformly, all sites seem to have a better overall survival uh, compared to gemcitabine alone. The addition of cisplatin did improve their survival. And you can see that in this side um, on this graph. Moving on to targeted therapies. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a bunch of targeted agents that seem to work well 
uh, in this group of patients. And what was found was that there is something called as the IDH1 mutation. And if you can look for that on the next generation sequencing, we have a drug available that improves. Now, again, this is progression-free survival, uh, but that was what was looked for in the study. And what was found was that you did have an improvement in both um, disease, disease control rate as well as progression-free survival. Now, another target that's available in about uh, 30, about 15% of the patients is the FGF, FR mutation or uh, fibroblast growth factor receptor uh, agents. And in that group of patients, post gemcitabine, you can treat these patients with this agent, and that is also another drug available. Now, moving on to immunotherapy, and this is something that is the nuclear on the block, and this is how it works. Now, let's say if a protein or a polypeptide is presented to the immune cell, which is the T cell, by this tumor cell, uh, by itself, you're not going to have an immune response. That happens only when there is something called as co-stimulation. And the way that happens is, now this is a negative co-stimulation there is a connection between what is called as pd1 and pdl1 pd1 is on the t cell side pdl1 is on the tumor side now if this happens you actually have a blockage of the t cell response if you block this on either side what you will find is that you can actually get a t cell response Now, what you can see over here is a study by Ann et al. in Nature et al. And what they found was that you can get a good response and survival in this group of patients. And you can get about a 50 to 60 percent response uh, in this group of patients. Sometimes these can be a long term responses. So, those are the main approaches that we have for treating these patients. Some of these responses or some of these benefits can be modest, but they are better than best supportive care. And finally, we talk about palliation. Again, uh, draining the obstructed biliary tree, either percutaneously, sometimes doing surgical bypasses, as well as expandable metal stents which do help our patients with advanced disease. This is the final slide. Uh, biliary tract cancers, as you would agree, are associated with poor outcomes. In patients who've had a good surgical resection, either an R0 or R1 resection, oral capecitabine is a standard adjuvant therapy. If you have patients who have more advanced disease, you can give a combination of gemcitabine uh, and that improves both survival versus best supportive care in unresectable disease. If you have resectable disease, you can make it more resectable with gemcitabine. Uh, there are a variety of uh, targeted agents that work, including the PDL1 pathway, which we talked about, the FGFR, IDH1, and so on and so forth. So, hopefully, this will help us keep uh, patients' disease under control for a longer period of time. Uh, that is all I had to say. Thank you.